Welcome to ILTV's Israel Daily. I'm Lajar Gavelazi and coming up in today's newscast. Foreign Minister Yair Lapid meets with the U.S. Secretary of State in Rome. The search for survivors continues in the Florida building collapse. And despite an uptick in cases, Israel's coronavirus cabinet convenes and decides no new restrictions. The United States announced on Sunday that it conducted defensive precision airstrikes against facilities used by Iran-backed militia groups in the Iraq-Syria border region. According to a statement released by the Pentagon, the attack was at President Biden's direction. Pentagon Press Secretary John Kirby said in a statement that the U.S. strikes targeted operational and weapon storage facilities at two locations in Syria and one location in Iraq that were being utilized by Iran-backed militia groups for drone attacks against U.S. personnel and facilities in Iraq. The U.S. said the facilities were being used by Kataib Hezbollah and Kataib Said al-Shuhada, or KSS. While the U.S. statement did not address any casualties, according to Iranian media and several news sites, at least four members of Iranian-backed militias were killed in the attack. While Syria's state-run Sana news agency said one child had been killed and others wounded. Now, Foreign Minister Yair Lapid met with U.S. Secretary of State Antony Blinken on Sunday in Rome marking the first face-to-face -face meeting in his new role with his counterpart in the Biden administration. While the two had much to discuss, including Iran, normalization with Gulf states, and the Palestinian conflict, Lapid did not hold back in his criticism of Israel's previous government led by Benjamin Netanyahu, saying mistakes were made and pledging to fix them. He also expressed Israel's serious reservations over the Iran nuclear deal. ILTV's Hannah Rifkin with the report. Secretary Blinken and I represent new administrations. Yours a few months old, ours a few weeks old, almost a few days. But we also represent a very long and strong tradition of close friendship and cooperation. There is no relationship more important to Israel than the United States of America. There is no loyal friend to the United States of America than Israel. In the past few years, mistakes were made. Israel's bipartisan standing was heard. We will fix those mistakes together. These were the remarks made by Foreign Minister Yair Lapid ahead of a meeting with U.S. counterpart, Secretary of State Antony Blinken, in Rome. Lapid slamming the Netanyahu administration for diminishing bipartisan support for Israel, then saying that over the past few days, he spoke with a series of American leaders, both Democrat and Republican, in an effort to mend ties. With regards to Iran and the ongoing negotiations for a nuclear deal, a point of contention between the two countries, Lapid saying Israel has some serious reservations, though expressing hope the two administrations will work out their differences in private. We will have disagreements, but they are not about the essence. They are all about how to get there. We want the same things. We sometimes disagree about how to achieve. Israel has some serious reservations about the Iran nuclear deal that is being put together in Vienna. We believe the way to discuss those disagreements is through direct and professional conversation, not in press conferences. Lapid also thanking the U.S. for its support of Israel's normalization efforts in the region. Blinken in turn saying he's looking forward to working with the new Israeli coalition and above all stressing the importance of negotiations between Israelis and Palestinians and saying that the humanitarian situation in Gaza is a key issue on the agenda. Uh, you rightly noted our strong support uh, for the uh, normalization agreements, the, uh, the Abraham Accords with uh, uh, Israel's neighbors and beyond. Uh, we strongly support this, uh, and uh, hopefully there'll be other participants. Um, I think we've also uh, discovered or perhaps uh, rediscovered that as important as they are, as vital as they are, uh, they are not a substitute for uh, engaging on the uh, uh, issues between Israelis and Palestinians that need uh, to be uh, resolved. Following his meeting with Blinken, Lapid also meeting with the foreign minister of Bahrain. The two discussing expanding the normalization accords as well as Iran. And later this week, Lapid is also expected to visit the United Arab Emirates, a historic trip marking the first state visit by an Israeli minister. As Foreign Minister Yair Lapid met with U.S. Secretary of State Antony Blinken in Rome, 
Israeli President Reuven Rivlin meeting with U.S. President Joe Biden on Monday at the White House, both conveying a message of a new era for U.S.-Israel relations under the new administrations, but also expressing concerns over the Iran nuclear deal. So here to discuss the significance of these visits and the current state of Israel-U.S. relations is Professor Mark Mayorowitz from SUNY Maritime College in New York. Welcome. So it seems the new Israeli coalition, as well as the U.S. administration, are really trying to convey the sense of a new era of friendship between the two countries, especially now that Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu is gone. Yet there are so many issues of contention, mainly Iran. I mean, is this really the new reality, a new era, or is this, or is this just, you know, a honeymoon phase that will soon come to an end? I don't see any rift at all. I don't think it's a new era at all. The relationship, if you listen to the takeaways, is, is absolutely solid. Of course, there are always going to be issues. There have always been issues in U.S.-Israeli relations. But the purpose of the trip by Lapid is to solidify essentially a number of points. Number one, with a new coalition, we're also a fragile coalition, so you need to work with us to help us to remain in power. Secondly, Please continue the Abraham Accords. We see that the United States supports that. And Lapid is coming to mend fences with the Democratic Party because of the close relationship between President Trump and Prime Minister Netanyahu. Also, Iran obviously is on the table, and the issue of Israel and the Palestinians and Gaza are obviously there, and Blinken is interested in it. But the one thing that you actually didn't show in your uh, clip, which is really important, is when Lapid said to Blinken that you're a son of a Holocaust survivor and I know we can count on you. I think that to me is the most important takeaway. Lapid is not Kissinger, he's Anthony Blinken and he understands the significance of the relationship of, between the U.S. and Israel and the significance of the survival of Israel in a very, very difficult region, particularly with Iran. Now, Lapid also said yesterday in Rome that mistakes were made and will fix them. I mean, should he have acknowledged that in his first meeting? Do you think that was the right move undermining the previous coalition? Well, I mean, Israeli politics is Israeli politics. I mean, I don't know who was supposed to hear that. I think it was frank and it was very, uh, I think, candid. And I think the mending mission that he's on, he needs to be able to come straight and ahead to the Democrats because that's why he's here. The key issue domestically is cementing the relationship with Democrats because there's always been a strong relationship between the Democrats Republicans bipartisan with Israel, but we see that somewhat undermined now by this uh, groups in the Democratic Party, AOC and the others, who are uh, grandstanding against Israel. And so Lapid is coming to help cement that with the natural support of the Democratic Party. He's always been a supporter. So that, to me, is the key domestic takeaway. So I don't think it's a bad thing that he was candid. I think it's a good thing. I think people will appreciate that. I mean, do you think that this new coalition will be able to mend this rift with the Democratic Party, especially given the climate that you mentioned within the party? Oh, well, look, the President Biden is facing the same pressure on, on his issues from the progressive wing on his infrastructure and all the things he's doing as on the same issues on Israel and the Palestinians and Israel in the Middle East. It's the same thing. Biden, I believe, is a solid friend of Israel. And that's part of the Rivlin trip. See, the Rivlin trip, his last trip as president, he knows Biden. This is the personal relationship. We see from the summits that the personal relationship is very, very important to Biden. And sending President Rivlin is really, really important to mend that personal relationship because Biden is a great friend of Israel, but he has pressure from the Democrats. So what Lapid is coming to do and Rivlin is coming to do are to help to make this, to push this back to where it was, which is much more bipartisan. And as I said before, this close symbiotic between President Trump and Prime Minister Netanyahu tended to, you know, to be very candid, alienate many Democrats. Uh, we went through a very fraught period. We're now with Biden. He wants predictability and stability. And part of that is working out a good relationship with Israel where there are no surprises and that diplomacy is conducted quietly and not out on the full stage, because that is something the Democrats did not like, particularly President Obama, when Prime Minister Netanyahu went to Congress and basically 
rallied and lobbied against the Iran deal. I mean, he was right to be against the Iran deal, but to do it in that fashion across the other side of Washington, D.C., was a real turnoff for the Democrats. So that vestige of that feeling, that needs to be repaired, and I think it can be repaired. There are many, many friends in the Democratic Party who love and admire Israel. There's no question about it. But we, you know, we went off, we went off the derech, you know, we went off the path, and we got to get back on the path again. I think we will. And I think this is a very smart move, sending these, you know, the more seasoned president who knows everybody and the new uh, the new uh, foreign minister. And I think his remarks and the way he handled himself was really quite uh, quite adept. All right, Professor Mark Mayo, we thank you so much for taking the time to speak with us today. A pleasure. Now, moving on to the tragedy in Surfside. Search and rescue operations are ongoing as Israeli delegations join in the effort. Every minute counts, but with each passing day, there is less hope of finding survivors. The death toll currently at nine, with some 150 people still missing. Joining us now via Zoom from the ground is Uliel Goldberg, part of the Israeli Magen David Dome delegation, assisting in the efforts. Well, so you're there on the ground in Surfside. What can you tell us about the ongoing search and rescue operations? So up until today, um, there have been many teams working on the site, uh, American search and rescue team, fire brigades. Uh, and yesterday, the Israeli IDF search and rescue team joined uh, the efforts. Uh, the teams are working around the clock in teams on the site using various uh, tactics to try and find survivors. Um, they've been working long hours. It's very difficult. It's a very difficult sign, scene. Uh, the building, net, the, the half of the building which didn't collapse could collapse at any moment. Uh, there have been fires on the scene, which it all makes it very, very difficult to, to work. Is there still hope of finding survivors? I mean, it's already been a number of days. There have been incidences and, uh, and uh, buildings which have collapsed where people have survived longer. Uh, it's not looking too likely, but there always is the chance there, there may still be survivors underneath the rubble. Mm -hmm. Now, there have been reports that families are now being brought to the site to call out to their loved ones in an effort to, to help the search operations. Can you tell us about that? Is that in, in fact happening? Uh, the families were brought to the site yesterday. Uh, it wasn't to call out their loved ones. Um, the teams on the on the site they have uh, they have uh, different systems and and techniques which they use to find to find people. They were brought there to to get an understanding and, and to get a feeling that that they are, people are working. Uh, there was a misconception that that they weren't working on the site and uh, and there wasn't enough being done. So the families were brought by bus to the site to watch. To, to see and to ask questions. There were teams there who could answer, answer questions for them. Um, so they would get that feeling that, that all is being done. Now, the Israeli team is obviously bringing their expertise. How have you been welcomed at the site? So I came uh, as Magen David Adom at the request of Hatzalah South Florida. Uh, Magen David Adom is in contact with Hatzalah with around the world. Um, two years ago, we held a conference in Israel where we trained them on uh, this kind of uh, disaster, buildings which were destroyed, uh, earthquakes. And some of the first responders here were actually at the conference and used the skills which they, uh, which they learned in Israel uh, to, to save lives in the first minutes and hours before, before the teams arrived. Uh, the teams here are very, very welcoming of, of assistance uh, without anyone stepping on their toes, obviously. Uh, and that's it, we're here, we're here to assist. All right, Uliel Goldberg, thank you so much for taking the time to speak with us, and good luck with the ongoing efforts. Thank you. Now, moving on to the latest coronavirus updates. The new coronavirus cabinet met on Sunday night and decided that, for now, Israel will not impose any new restrictions. This despite the spread of the Delta variant internationally and within Israel. On Sunday morning, Prime Minister Naftali Bennett outlined his government's approach to dealing with the renewed outbreak of coronavirus cases in Israel. לכן הגישה שלנו פשוטה, מקסימום הגנה על אזרחי ישראל עם מינימום פגיעה בשגרה ובמשק בישראל. מסכות במקום הגבלות, חיסונים במקום סגרים. And this is the policy that the new coronavirus cabinet adopted Sunday night, announcing that no new restrictions would be imposed at this stage. Instead, the cabinet decided on a number of preventative measures, namely that the National Coronavirus Project Director, Professor Nachman Ash, 
and International Crossings Director Major General Oni Numa would formulate a recommendation for an enforcement model regarding quarantines with an emphasis on people returning from abroad. It was also decided to advance a plan for the full genetic sequencing of all people entering the country. Additionally, the government decided on an information campaign to focus on encouraging vaccinations with an emphasis on young people aged 12 to 16. Prime Minister Bennett already implementing this policy, releasing a video Monday morning calling on young people to go and get vaccinated. Meanwhile, Professor Nachman Ash was appointed by Health Minister Nitzan Horowitz on Monday as the new Director General of the Health Ministry. This following the resignation of Professor Chezi Levy from the Post Sunday evening. As the new Delta variant sweeps across the world, the new Israeli administration attempting to prevent its spread within Israel through a policy of maximum protection and minimum disruption. Here to discuss the latest cabinet decisions is Professor Nadav Davidovich from the Department of Health Systems Management from Ben Gurion University in the Negev. Welcome. So first of all, we see, we've seen outbreaks in Binyamina, a city which is still red, and other cities which are turning from green to red and yellow, though it seems the number of cases seems to have dropped. So what can you tell us about the state of the virus spread in Israel at the moment? So actually, it's not a big surprise. We were aware that there are going to be a different uh, variants. A variant, uh, the Delta variant is spreading uh, about 50% uh, faster. Uh, we see localized outbreaks mainly because uh, there are uh, children that are not immunized. And unfortunately, uh, all the entrants from abroad, um, the situation at the Ben Gurion airport was still very uh, problematic. I hope these things are going to be uh, solved with the new uh, tower of uh, uh, the airport, uh, uh, Ronnie Numa is a general, and I think the integration of work is very important uh, uh, here. What we need to do now is speeding up vaccination, especially among those who are 50 years older that are in high risk, about 200,000 of them. And of course, children that now we know that it's uh, safe and efficient to vaccinate. My child is going to be vaccinated second dose uh, tomorrow. He's 14 and very excited. So given this picture that you've just presented, uh, you seem to agree with the cabinet decision not to impose any sanctions. Uh, at, is that the right decision, you think? Uh, this was our recommendation from the cabinet of uh, experts. Um, we have now, again, the masks that, are, uh, that are, should be, be wearing in uh, closed places. Uh, we need to still continue and follow the situation if a uh, number of cases are going to be increased. There is an option to return uh, the green pass. Uh, the only thing is that we must uh, supply also uh, tests that are going to be uh, maybe subsidized. Uh, and again, the situation at the airport that should be tightened. Uh, otherwise, we need to learn to live with the virus. This is the most important recommendation uh, because uh, uh, this is not going to be eradicated, especially since there are gaps that are huge among different uh, countries. So speeding up vaccines, Ben Gurion Airport, masks, and also personal uh, behavior, hygiene, all of that, and responsibility. Uh, we're not expected to see a fourth wave as we saw uh, in previous ones in January and October because we have high rates of vaccinations. And is there a risk of a fourth wave with children since they are currently not vaccinated? We're probably going to see some local outbreaks among uh, children. Uh, of course, I urge children that can, those who are over 12 to be vaccinated, those who are younger, uh, again, uh, there might be an option for some local uh, outbreaks, but if we keep hygiene, if we keep masks in closed uh, places, uh, and also when people are returning from abroad, they should comply with all the regulations. Uh, I think that this is something that uh, can keep uh, the outbreak uh, in a kind of a normal, the new normal uh, phase uh, without uh, getting the high number of severe cases and hospitalization that we saw in uh, previous uh, months. Uh, so we need to learn to live with the virus. This is the main uh, message here. The main message. All right, Professor Nadav Davidovich, thank you so much for taking the time to speak with us and good health to all. 
The foreign ministry on Sunday summoned Poland's ambassador to Israel to express his disappointment with new Polish legislation that would place a time limit on contesting past administrative decisions on World War II era property restitution claims. This led Poland in turn to summon Israel's ambassador to the country. While Foreign Minister Yair Lapid and Polish Prime Minister exchanging heated words in the press. Joining us now to discuss the growing rift between Israel and Poland, it's Svi Ravnil, former Israeli ambassador to Poland. So first of all... Good evening. Good evening. Welcome. So first of all, can you briefly explain the significance of this legislation? Poland saying it's to prevent fraud and irregularities, while Israel says it will effectively prevent Jews from reclaiming property lost in the Holocaust. What's your take? Well, in, indeed, uh, Poland uh, signed a declaration uh, uh, about uh, uh, 2009 uh, the, the so-called Terezin declarations were all the countries uh, uh, related to the Holocaust in Europe uh, have declared uh, their commitment, among, among other issues like the uh, teaching, uh, the, the Holocaust memorial, the commemoration, the preservation of uh, Holocaust memorial, uh, and so on. Also, the uh, a commitment uh, to uh, for a restitution of Jewish properties uh, lost during the war. Uh, not necessarily all the, uh, all the properties uh, left, not necessarily everything, but they have committed themselves uh, to do something, to uh, pass a legislation which uh, is going to enable uh, Jews and especially uh, the problem of uh, properties without uh, benefactors, without, uh, without uh, inheritors, uh, to, to find some solutions. Now, all the countries, all the countries uh, who signed this declaration uh, 12 years ago, uh, have passed some legislation. Uh, I wouldn't say that this was always necessarily the best, the, the most uh, the perfect uh, uh, legislation, but nevertheless, these were, um, uh, uh, these were sincere uh, attempts uh, to find some solution to this very complicated problem. Now, former uh, Ambassador, uh, we're, we're almost out of time, so I just want to get your take on this as well. I mean, how do you think this, this new legislation will affect greater Israel-Poland relations, given what's been going on? Uh, well, it has been affecting. This is, the, I have to say, it's not new. For the last two or three years, we we have been uh, arguing with the Poles concerning the the law on historians, uh, a slander to, to to say that the Poles uh, were involved in killing of Jews. Uh, well, it was uh, uh, legislated as a slander to Poland. So the uh, uh, the uh, the tension has been uh, building up for the last two years, I would say, and it came now to the to its peak with this exchange. I'm I'm very sorry for it because after all, Poland is an important country. Poland is a friendly country. We share interest, interest, economic interest, even even defense interest. We do share. It's it's a pity. I'm it is. I'm very sorry about it. Uh, maybe the tone would have been uh, a little bit less sharper, that would, uh, would have been more uh, useless and fruitful. Uh, unfortunately, this is not the situation at the moment. And yes, we are in a, in a crisis, and I don't know at the moment how... I hope this, this legislation is not going to pass. It has not yet been finalized. I, I still have the hope, but if it does, we have a problem. All right, former Ambassador Tzvi Ravnil, thank you so much for taking the time to join us today. Let's take a look at the weather forecast with Hannah Rifkin. Hey, Lee Dar. We've got sunny skies and sizzling temperatures as we start the transition into midsummer weather. Tonight's lows expecting to be in the lower to upper 20s in Celsius. And then meteorologists predicting tomorrow's temperatures highs mostly in the mid to upper 30s in Celsius with the northernmost region of Israel at 38 and the southernmost region at 41. My tip for all our viewers, if you're out and about, take caution, wear a hat, sunscreen, and of course, bring enough water. Now, back to the studio. All right, that's it for today's news. Today's exchange rate is 3.6 shekels to the American dollar and 2.65 shekels to the Canadian dollar. And finally, for the latest updates and news from ILTV, please like ILTV on Facebook, follow us on Instagram, and subscribe to our YouTube channel, as well as to our newsletter at ILTV.tv. I'm the Dargave Lazi. Be well and thank you so much for watching.